today is a very important day. I will be altering the, the format for today. We'll simply take the remarks of the chairman. Thereafter, the national coordinator will come to the podium to elaborate on certain aspects of the remarks of the chairman. At the end of the elaboration, we'll take your questions and responses will flow from there. So at this point, let me please plead with you that we do not wish to be cut off from the live broadcast because of the news belt. So we'll roll the program very smoothly and quickly. We'll come up to, make, to, to ask your questions, make it concise, make it precise so that the answers can come early. Then I invite the chairman of the Presidential Task Force on COVID-19 to the podium to present his remarks. Members of the Presidential Task Force, the distinguished ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen of the press, our sincere apologies again for starting this briefing late had quite a lot of issues to deliberate upon. However, I welcome you all to the national briefing by the Presidential Task Force on COVID-19 for Thursday, 6th of August, 2020. For the past nine weeks, precisely from 2nd of June, 2020, we've been running the phase two of the ease lockdown, which has witness two extensions. These extensions were necessitated by the observed lack of compliance with prescribed measures, dangers associated with community spread infections, and the need to strengthen critical areas of the response strategy for effectiveness. Prior to the Salah break, the Presidential Task Force informed the nation that the sixth interim report and the recommendations would be submitted to Mr. President for his consideration and approval. I'm therefore pleased to inform you that the PTF team met with the President on Wednesday, 5th August 2020, to appraise him of the situation on COVID-19 and the next steps. Suffice it to state that the recommendations made to the President have been born out of diligent evaluation of the situation in Nigeria, as well as regional and global experiences. Our considerations were also guided by three thematic areas, namely one, movement, two, industry and labor, and three, community activities. The Presidential Task Force, within the same period of reporting, prioritized the following areas of major focus for the extended second phase of the response. Using data and science to inform decision making, improving the efficiency of the response activities, emphasizing personal responsibility of individuals in preventing transmission and supporting the healthcare system and strengthening the adoption of non-pharmaceutical interventions. But before I unveil the details of the next steps in our national response, the Presidential Task Force finds it necessary to take you through a review of our situation. Domestically, in the last month, the number of states with over 1,000 confirmed cases increased from 4 to 10 in the Federal Capital Territory. While Nigeria has conducted 43% more tests in July than was done in June, the positivity rate has also decreased showing the progress made in access to testing. Likewise, our case management efforts have also seen a reduction in the fatality rate 
from 1.9% in June to 1.7% in July. Community transmission is increasing as reflected in the fact that as of today, 536 local government areas out of the 774, equivalent to 69% of the total, have reported a COVID-19 case. Figure one below, which they would show up on the screen there, depicts the EP curve of COVID-19 in Nigeria, with slight declines from July 28th, 2020, while figure two, which is the map of Nigeria, and differentiates shows the confirmed cases by state and approximate numbers. The Presidential Task Force has used this data to help guide response and inform the policies it has recommended. We have also found it necessary to bring you a month-on-month -month comparative statistics for similar dates, 4th July and 4th August, to enable you to capture the new developments worldwide on the continent of Africa and in Nigeria. Though the pictures are not very sharp and you can't see the figures from there, but by the time you get a copy of my speech, you see the glaring figures. But permit me to draw your attention to the global cases as of 4th of July, 2020. The global figure stood at 10.9 million cases globally. As of 4th of August, that figure jumped exponentially to 18.142 million. In terms of absolute figure, we recorded an increase of 7.220 million in just one month globally, representing 66 percentage of the infections. On the continent of Africa, as of 4th July 2020, the recorded cases stood at 342,415,000. ,415 on the 4th of August, on the African continent, the number had jumped to 825,272 cases. In terms of absolute figure, we have on record 482,857 cases in just one month. And in terms of percentage, that percentage stood at 141 percentage in terms of growth. In our country, Nigeria, as of 4th of July, 2020, our statistics shows that we had 28,167 cases. By the 4th of August 2020, we have recorded, in terms of number of cases, 44,433 cases. In absolute figures, within a period of one month, we recorded 16,200 and 66 cases, representing 58 percentage. And in the same vein, if you look at the percentages, the figures of fatalities, globally, on the same day, 4th July, the record shows 523,011 fatalities on the 4th of August, the figure had risen to 691,013 fatalities. In absolute figures, we 
we recorded fatalities in one month globally of 168,002 persons day, representing 32 percentage. Similarly, on the African continent, in terms of fatalities, in the month of July 4th, the record shows 6,628 fatalities. In the month of August, that figure jumped to 14,139 fatalities. And in terms of absolute figures, it, the record shows 7,511 in just one month, representing in terms of percentage growth, 113 percent. In our country, Nigeria, 4th of July, Fatalities stood at 400, I mean 643, while in the, on the 4th of uh, August, that figure rose to 910. In terms of figures, absolute figures, we recorded in just this one month, 276 deaths, representing 44 percentage. I have taken time to give you this picture so that we have an appreciation of the magnitude of the ravaging effect of COVID-19 globally on the African continent and in our country, Nigeria. The world continues to be confronted with the reality of the new normal foisted on all humanity by the outbreak of the coronavirus pandemic. The virulence and novelty of the virus has made it compelling for humanity to work together, to put in place strategies to contain its spread and ensure that the delicate balance between dealing with the pandemic as a public health concern and guaranteeing livelihood is maintained. The details of the above data guided our national response and inform the policies put in place, which played key roles in recording the following successes. One, use of data and technology in improving surveillance, contact tracing, and testing efforts. And two, significantly increasing testing capacity with the activation of 60 laboratories in 31 states and the federal capital territory, as well as the accreditation of several private health laboratories into the system of the testing, doubling the number of tests taken within a month from 130,000 to 304,221. And four, Increase risk awareness through collaboration with traditional religious and community leaders as well as other partners. Five, ensured longer collaboration and partnership with the legislature. And six, successfully evacuation of over 8,000 stranded Nigerians abroad at minimal cost to the government continued strong coordination with the private sector to mobilize resources for the response. And it mobilize more partner support for the response at the state level. Nine join the global community in the critical trials for vaccine ahead of a potential mass deployment. And 10, laying the foundation for homegrown research activities for a domestic cure. And 11, develop guidelines to support the safe reopening of safe reopening of other sectors of the economy. And 12, providing technical support for the development of incidents action plans 
IAPs for the states and 13 holding regular consultation with the state governors, commissioners for health and other related sectors. Our assessment has also revealed that the foregoing accomplishments and plans notwithstanding, the following challenges continue to pose considerable concern. And the first of such challenges, the increased non-compliance with pharmaceutical prevention measures. The second being lack of enforcement of necessary guidelines issued to preserve lives. And the third, the insufficient engagement by some states with the national response and the lingering concern about the gap between identified cases and the actual burden of the disease. And lastly, apathy, fatigue, and disbelief, combining to challenge public entitlement, compliance, and behavior change. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, to address these challenges and continue improving our national response to eventually win the fight against the pandemic, the Presidential Task Force reached the conclusion that for Nigeria, it is important to ensure that restrictions are not completely relaxed in order to control and abate further community transmission. It is also important that at this community transmission phase of the pandemic, subnational governments set up to take more responsibilities by owning the response and the process. To sustain gains already made, therefore, the presidential task force recommended to the president the further retention of the current phase of the response with minor changes or adjustments to address economic, social political, and health concerns. These measures are further outlined in the guidelines, which the national coordinator will elaborate more extensively on. It is, however, important to inform you that major changes being proposed are aimed at achieving the following. Gradual reopening of international air flights within established parameters, reopening of rail transportation within established parameters, which was undertaken on the 29th of July, 2020, and also continuation of the permit granted to exit classes to resume ahead of examinations, particularly the West African examinations and other examinations as provided for by the Federal Minister of Education. And now further allowing civil servants from grade level 12 to resume work who would provide essential services for the workings of the public sector. And finally, opening recreational parks for supervised exercises. After due consideration of the recommendations, Mr. President has approved the following. Maintaining the current phase of the national response to COVID-19 for another four weeks in line with the modifications reflected in the report, the sixth interim report we submitted, which the national coordinator will give you further details on. B, partnering with states and local governments to improve community sensitization and engagement to the COVID-19 response. And C, mandating state authorities and the federal capital territory to enforce non-pharmaceutical guidelines, primarily the use of face masks in public appearances and places. D, encouraging state governments to collaborate with the local government authorities to intensify necessary measures such as contact tracing, grassroots mobilization, 
and raise communication. And finally, strengthening of collaboration with other mandate groups at the federal stock state levels to harmonize the country's COVID-19 response on the short, medium, and long-term basis. Before I round up, I wish to remind all Nigerians that this fight is for every one of us and that you must take responsibility for your actions or your actions. Disbelief and skepticism will further complicate our situation and we should not stigmatize anyone infected. Our communities should own the response and continue to educate our citizens about the need to keep themselves safe and to take personal responsibility for their actions. It is now my privilege to invite the national coordinator to provide the details of the revised guidelines. I thank you so much for your kind attention and have a good day. The Chairman of the Presidential Task Force, um, Honorable Ministers, uh, members of the PTF, uh, gentlemen of the press, um, good evening. So as, as you're aware, um, we are currently in phase two of the East lockdown, which started on the 1st of June, uh, 2020. Uh, since then, we've made um, several minor adjustments to accommodate for the gradual reopening of the economy as well as to address uh, key challenges in the response. We have made a, an assessment of the current phase, and as mentioned by the chairman, uh, we have made recommendations to Mr. President to retain the current phase of the response with minor changes to address um, some of the challenges we see on the economic, social, political, and health front. The assessment that we did has revealed that there's a lot of non-compliance with our non-pharmaceutical interventions, a lot of disbelief, skepticism, negativity with regards to the COVID pandemic. It is very clear that we need to have additional interventions to improve compliance with our non-pharmaceutical measures and our protocols. We also need to strengthen the engagement of communities and local authorities in prevention campaigns, as well as expand on the current rollout of precision-based control measures in high burden local governments in the country. Uh, further to this, and effective from um, uh, early morning hours of today, the measures put in place for the current phase two of the ease lockdown shall be maintained while addressing some specific aspects. These include maintaining the current nationwide curfew from 10 p.m. to 4 a.m., maintaining the restrictions on mass gatherings with specific emphasis on protecting vulnerable populations. We continue to urge persons above the age of 60 those that have underlying medical illnesses such as diabetes and cardiovascular disease, and those that have immunosuppression to please stay at home and limit uh, their interaction with the general public. We also strongly recommend, and this has been accepted, that government meetings continue to be virtual as much as possible while maintaining restrictions on physical meetings including official trips, oversight, visits, and board meetings until further notice. The restrictions in the education and entertainment sector, as well as for other activities that attract mass gatherings, such as operations of markets and worship centers, remain. In particular, I would like to talk more about the general movement aspects. In terms of general movement, uh, persons may go out for work to buy necessary food 
and for exercise specific to air transportation. As you are aware, domestic operations have already resumed. The railway sector has also restarted. For international travel, we have made recommendations to the aviation industry to commence the process for opening international airports, provided all existing international and local prevention guidelines on COVID-19 are in place. We have modified the advice with regards to arrival for flights. Passengers arriving at the airports for domestic flights are advised to arrive at least one and a half hours before their flight and three hours before international flights where these restart. For interstate travel, Free movement of people and goods across state borders will continue, but only outside the curfew hours. Strict compliance is required with guidelines drawn by the Federal Ministry of Transportation, as well as the advisory provided by the Federal Road Safety Corps, as it relates to reduced occupancy for vehicles. Passengers are requested to report any public transport operator who fails to comply with the FRSC guidelines that have been agreed with major transport stakeholders. And with this particular phase, we will continue to push for the security services and enforcement agencies to make sure that they do their job of protecting public health. With regards to intrastate travel, we will continue with the policy of reduced occupancy to half for buses and a maximum of three passengers for normal taxis. With industry and labor, the main modification we have is an advisory for banks to limit the number of customers within their operating areas to 50% occupancy within the banking halls in order to allow for physical distancing and to limit their workers to 75% or less. But banking operations shall continue as usual. For government offices and other corporate offices, we are now extending working hours to normal official hours from Monday to Friday with the mandatory use of non-medical face masks. We encourage work at home policy for civil slash public servants below the grade level of 12. Essential staff of grade level 12 and above may be allowed to come to work. Our previous um, cutoff was grade level 14. Um, temperature checks will be carried out in all official government buildings. For personalized services, we we'll continue to allow um, personalized services such as mechanics, artisans, uh, hair salons, etc., who own their own workshops or workstations and can clearly adhere to non-pharmaceutical interventions. We're particularly concerned about the low level of compliance with wearing face masks. And uh, with the current extension of this phase, as I said earlier, we will be working with state authorities to start enforcing this and looking at alternative uh, legal ways of um, uh, changing behavior. For markets, no major change apart from the issue of uh, face masks that continues to be of concern. For hotels, restaurants, and eateries, hotels may continue to remain open, but must observe all mandatory non-pharmaceutical interventions. Restaurants to maintain the takeaway slash delivery system until further notice. Bars, gyms, cinemas, 
and nightclubs remain closed until further evaluation. We have advised the National Youth Service Corps to start planning ahead of resumption in future phases, but not within this current phase of the response. We will work closely with them to design policies that may allow this to happen in the future. For community activities, as it relates to daycare and primary schools, all daycare and primary schools are to remain closed till further evaluation. However, while primary schools must remain closed, registered pupils may proceed to take the national common entrance as soon as it is feasible, provided there is compliance with issued non-pharmaceutical guidelines. For secondary and tertiary institutions, just to clarify, these remain closed. However, we have made arrangements for exiting or graduating students in their final years of secondary school to resume and partake in exams in line with guidelines issued by the Federal Ministry of Education. However, schools must comply with the six recommended steps and required measures issued by the Federal Ministry of Education and which is available online. There are no new changes to uh, places of worship. Our policy remains the same. For recreational parks slash communal sports, restriction is removed on outdoor communal non-contact sports and the use of recreational parks for supervised physical exercise, not for social interactions, but supervised physical exercise. For recreational parks that are unable to enforce this, we expect them to remain closed. For outdoor non-contact sports, this includes uh, lawn tennis, table tennis, squash, badminton, cycling, athletics, golf, polo, para-athletics, cricket, and other non-contact outdoor communal activities. In the event that people are not certain, please contact the Federal Ministry of Youth and Sports for further guidance. Visiting of hospitalized patients is, remains limited to immediate family, and we continue to recommend a maximum of 20 people, including close family members, when it comes to attendance of funerals and other essential gatherings, such as weddings, that cannot be um, changed. So these are the main changes. Most of them are minor adjustments. And as I said earlier, we are continuing with the current phase two of the response. I'd like to conclude by thanking the general public for continuing to support the presidential task force and the protocols that we have set up, and more importantly, for continuing to be patient with us as we get over this pandemic as soon as possible. Thank you. Good evening, Chairman and members of the PTF and my colleagues. My name is Mitaire Ikwen. I report for the NTA. Um, I want to ask the national coordinator, how soon or how long do you expect the Ministry of Aviation to prepare for reopening of international flights? And how soon, if it's possible to give us a date for the reopening of international flights? Thank you. Good evening, sir. The SDF, sir, uh, I think I want to direct my question to you, sir. It's just some, uh, some couple of sections in your speech, sir. You talked about enforcement. And I can remember vividly that some of these extensions we've had is due to the non-compliance of some of these non-pharmaceutical orders. Now that we are having another four-week extension, 
what measures is being put in place to ensure strict compliance of all these guidelines that have been set out? Thank you very much. Good evening, all. Rachel Abuja from the News Agency of Nigeria. My question is for uh, the coordinator and the SGF, of course. Now, with the new announcements of guidelines that will take this from, um, that will take us to September, right? And um, the, the month that the PTF is meant to like um, formally disband the activities. Now, going forward, how are we going to be addressing the increasing cases and all? And my next question is for the coordinator too. How effective is the use of technology for surveillance? Now, given our whole network around the country, and again, um, will the students that will be resuming for their final, um, what do you call, class, um, exams or what do you call, why, will they be tested? Are we looking at testing all of them? Because if we truly want to like um, get the two million test, I think um, we should start from the student suggestion anyway. My last question for the DG NCDC, even though you didn't say anything. So what challenges have we had so far in contact tracing? Because we are now going into the community or we are already in the community transmission. So because I heard you once, you once said that if we're into uh, community transmission, you know, it's going to be difficult to do contact tracing. And it was mentioned here. Thank you very much. The Chairman, National Coordinator, members of the PTF, my colleagues. My name is Amaka Ude. I report for Arise News. And I have one simple question for the National Coordinator. And it has to do with the banks. Um, with this new protocol that you have just spoken about where you're actually limiting the number of people in the banking hall. It's okay, I understand. We're trying to curb a lot of people gathering in one place. But there have been concerns raised by Nigerians. Some banks, since even the easing of the lockdown, some of them, their branches are not open. Access Bank, for one, there's just one branch of Access Bank currently functioning in Abuja. You can only imagine the kind of crowd that you see there. So this is more like a commendation or just what can we do really to get these banks to open up more branches so we limit the number of people we have in a place at a time. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So uh, before I start with the questions, just to uh, clarify, uh, I have a request to clarify. So all civil and public servants um, on a grade level 12 and above essential duties um, may resume uh, normal working hours, so they are no longer um, going home at 2 p.m. So it's normal working hours, Monday to Friday, but from grade level 12 and above. So um, the first question has to do more with aviation. I'm sure the Honorable Minister of Aviation will answer it, but um, uh, there may be requirements for additional infrastructure in some of the airports. What we want to do, and uh, we've made it very clear uh, at the PTF, is we want to open as soon as possible, but in a safe manner that does not um, put at risk all the efforts we've done to control this pandemic. Um, but I'm sure the Honorable Minister of Aviation will, will provide additional information. Hopefully, the airports will open in weeks rather than months. That's what we're looking at. Uh, the other question has to do with what measures should we do, what should we do different in order to ensure strict compliance. So. It's all about behavioral change. And uh, behavioral change is all about modifying our risk perception and to making sure that people understand um, what it means to catch COVID and how to protect themselves. Repeatedly, the NOI calls that we have done week to week have shown that the issue is not about knowledge. Nigerians know virtually, all Nigerians know about COVID or have heard of it. 90 to 95% of our polls show that Nigerians know how to protect themselves. But the issue is moving from knowledge to action. Um, behavioral change doesn't necessarily equate to enforcement because the best way to get a persons to change their behavior is to convince them 
that it's in their best interest to do so or it's in the interest of their families and loved ones. We, the police cannot be everywhere at the same time. Having said this, we will continue to work more closely at the, the state level and at the community level to enforce some of these face masks, um, some of these um, measures, particularly the issue of uh, wearing face masks, which is a simple intervention that we know can go a long way towards cutting transmission. Um, we will also work more closely with other parts of the security services and enforcement agencies, such as road safety from the transport side um, and from the aviation side, and also working with other sectors of the economy. If you're not wearing a face mask, you should not be allowed access into a public building. If you're not wearing a face mask, you should not be provided with services. What happens in September for PTF? Well, we still have another four weeks before the next phase. So that will take us to early September. Uh, the PTF was inaugurated on the 16th of, 16th of March. So 17th of March, uh, Chairman, apologies. So we, we still have some time after the, the next phase to, 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 to discuss and decide how the transition will happen. But obviously um, that will be a decision by Mr. President. How effective is surveillance with the current technology we have in the country? Well, actually, we've been, in Nigeria, we are actually quite fortunate. We do have a fairly good telecommunication system, to be honest. Um, what we don't have is access to some of the tools that have been used in other parts of the world. So, for instance, access to mapping technology, movement, data, etc. But nevertheless, um, the surveillance that NCDC is doing, for instance, their ability to generate results daily, every day, is no mean feat. And it's linked to the ability to use um, data systems that are quite robust. Um, in addition to that, there's also the issue of um, additional um, interventions that require more close, uh, more close monitoring that could use technology which we haven't got to at this stage in time. But almost certainly, technology, we have to use technology in order to get on top of the COVID pandemic since we don't have a vaccine, we don't have a preventive therapy and um, making use of technology, um, especially when it relates to providing information on uh, on prevention measures or um, assessing compliance will be critical. Um, the NCDC will continue to work, I'm sure, with the NCC and other, other parts of the IT industry. A very good example is the move now towards people accessing their results online. You have a COVID test done, you no longer have to rely on being phoned. There's a trial going on that will allow persons to just log on. You will be given a number through your phone and um, you can access your own result and print it out. Um, but I don't think um, we are at a huge disadvantage as a country when it comes to technology. Start testing students before resuming. The PTF does not recommend testing of students before they resume school. A good reason is because if you do a test today and you are negative, the value of that test is at the time the sample was taken. Next day, 12 hours, 24 hours, the next day, two days, three days later, that report has no value. So our policy remains the same. Students do not need to be tested before they resume classes. What is more important is monitoring symptoms and making sure you pick symptoms up early and you exclude those that have symptoms. Uh, limit banking hole, Amaka, so I completely agree with you. A lot of the changes we have um, pushed through over the last few months in terms of adjustments to the faith has to do with the need for the economy to open up. So banks, more than two months ago, I believe, we said banks can fully resume. What do we mean by full resumption? We don't mean that they can select the branches that they can open. And we no longer have restrictions in terms of the number of branches that banks can open. All we said is we will prefer them to have 
75% of their staffing capacity. And we would prepare them within the banking halls to reduce the number of people within the banking halls to not more than 50% at any time. But customers do not come to the bank and spend the whole day in a bank. They come and go. So they should be able to stagger customers to get people in. But there, there, we would strongly recommend to the banking sector to open up banks so that people can not be inconvenienced unnecessarily. This is no longer about COVID. This is all about making sure that they improve their operational efficiency. Thank you. Chair of the Presidential Task Force, Honorable Ministers, uh, <coughs> Rachel, very quick answer to your question. I'll actually broaden out that question a little bit. Um, in, in all the comments made by the Chair of our Task Force, uh, in all the briefings back from Mr. President, one constant has been that while some restrictions are being eased, the public health response is actually being strengthened. So today we came out of a National Council of Health meeting led by the Honorable Minister of Health with all the commissioners of health from across the country. And what we collectively agreed was in order for our economy to open, uh, in order for our country to restart slowly, in order for the full benefits of the ease of the restrictions that were being implemented, we on the public health side had the responsibility to strengthen our response. And so that's what we're going to do collectively. Now, going down to your specific question around contact tracing, what I said, yes, it is harder when you have com community transmission, but it's not impossible. It just means we have to deploy more resources collectively. So at the moment, for instance, NCC, we still have a team of about 40 people supporting Lagos State alone. That is because we recognize that the the size of the challenge, a third of all the cases in Nigeria are still reported in Lagos, even though their cases are declining over the last few weeks. So where you have a lot of cases in the community, it's a little bit more difficult to do contact tracing, but it's not impossible. It depends on the resources that you have to focus on that. But my message really is across the country, the public health response is actually being strengthened. And we will know we have to continue. Uh, until we have a vaccine, there won't be a point where we say, okay, let's relax. That's completely out of the question. So the meeting we had today with the Honorable Commissioners was to really encourage ourselves, to give ourselves, um, uh, you know, the motivation to keep going, despite six months of really tough work. And so we will continue doing that across the public health infrastructure so that the rest of the country can at least look forward to uh, leaving with covid so until we have a vaccine further down the line. Thank you. Uh, gentlemen of media, uh, good afternoon to you. Um, regarding the question as to the opening of the airports, I'd like to use this uh, opportunity and this medium also to reiterate uh, and to be consistent with what we've been saying out here and for people to hear and to respond to all those my friends on uh, Twitter and other social media platforms um, to understand that this is not purely an aviation function. It's all to do with our health and it's so huge that it cost Mr. President in his wisdom to set up the presidential tax force on COVID-19. And this is universal and global. And this is in the interest of the nation and its citizens. We in civil aviation want to open like yesterday. We are bleeding. We are psyching our workers. We are not paying salaries. You must move. You must fly from one point to another to pay for the airfare, for us to make money and remain in business and pay our salaries. So we really, really want to open. But we can't open alone. Within the space where we operate, within our area of operations, we've got all kinds of people in there in the airports. We've got immigration, we've got police, we've got customs, we've got civil defense, we've got everybody in there, hot health, etc. etc. 
So the PTF Tax Force COVID-19 had set up that technical committee uh, to come up with this date where everybody is happy to start. If it is, if it is our own, we wouldn't want to have even close the airports anyway. We are forced by this monster to close. So we will open as soon as one of us are happy to open and I want to adopt what the national coordinator has said. It will be in weeks rather than a month. Uh, so please do not put any blame on anybody. Not on our chairman, please kindly. He's been spending all of his hours, all of his man hours on this COVID-19 tax force. And you remember he's the anchor of this government and this country, the government of the federation. Also, please do not put it on the Minister of Health, Ministers of Health. Please don't. And also don't put it on me. Put it on COVID-19. And then we're doing everything that we can possible to open. We feel your pain. We know that this closure of airports has separated families and friends, had denied you access to hospitals abroad, had denied you access to your schools, had denied you access to your businesses. We feel this pain. Some of us have been there, done that. We've lived abroad. We know how it feels. So some of us here also have their families out there. So it is not on purpose and punitive. No. It is that we all remain safe and healthy. We, we honestly want to open and government is conscious of this fact. And are all aware of the adverse effect of this closure of airports. So government is doing everything possible to ensure that these airports are open. And it's a collective effort being anchored by the PTF under the chairmanship of the Secretary of Government of Federation. So it will be in weeks rather than a month. And we seek for your understanding. And please help us to spread like you usually do. And we count on your support. Thank you very much. Well, I think the, all the questions have been taken. What measures are being put in place to, uh, to deal with enforcement? Uh, AIT. Yes. Well, uh, the task force as, uh, as a body, I think we've done everything humanly possible to engage with those that have responsibilities. You had the DG, Nigeria uh, Center for Disease Control, uh, saying that uh, they just uh, came out of a meeting of the National Council on Health. This evening at 8 o'clock, I will be engaging with the subcommittee of the uh, National Economic Council, where there are about uh, six or seven governors representing uh, the, uh, the council directly dealing with issues of COVID-19. Uh, that committee is chaired by Governor uh, Patrick Yakoa of uh, Delta State. All the matters that have been discussed on those different platforms has to deal with how do we sustain the national response, We're particularly conscious of the fact that we are now at the community stage of transmission and with no cure or vaccine in sight. So the only weapons we've got in our hands are the non-pharmaceutical measures that have been put in place. That's the only thing we've got in our hands. That's the only thing that can protect you from either getting infected or not. And the ownership of the process of that must be cascaded to the different levels, the local government, the communities, and the states. And that's why we keep emphasizing to the subnationals that they have an additional responsibility. Because the federal government as represented by the task force, does not have direct dealings with the people that are supposed to be asked to comply. We generally set guidelines and protocols. But when it comes to enforcement, I've stated this over and over. 
is the responsibilities of the subnationals because they equally sign the quarantine laws or regulations in their various states. And embedded in those quarantine regulations are the issues of penalties and enforcement. And that's why, like for FCT, they sit at the Eagle Square, the mobile court, and they pass and fine and judge people and give different penalties. The aspect of compliance, like the National Coordinator rightly stated to me, uh, calls for a paradigm shift, behavioral change, which we need in this country as we continue to navigate this uncharted waters of trying to find a way to get out of where we are now. Unlike the Honorable Minister for Aviation, rightly observed, I, we, we, we feel the pains of Nigeria. We know the frustrations that come with you. We know exactly what is happening. The negative economic impact of COVID-19 the story cannot be told now. Down the line, years from today, those adverse effects will continue to show on our earning capacities, on our abilities to live good and well-being lives, because it has impacted every aspect of our lives. It has impacted how we access medical care, there are people that have comorbidities, some health challenges. You can't even access that now because of the total disruption of our healthcare system. Even access to issues of governance, access to legitimate earnings have been disrupted. So many people, if we had a, a, a situation of where people file for unemployment, like like uh, the, uh, the way it happens in some developed economies. You would have seen people lined up at the offices of labor or unemployment bureaus to file those uh, uh, filing numbers about the fact that they are out of jobs. So the adverse effect of COVID-19 is so obvious and real. And the disruption it has caused to our lives will continue for a little while. But I'm confident that the resilient spirit that, of Nigerians that we have always exhibited will be what will take us through. But how do we get through? We can only get through if we just comply with the basic non pharmaceutical interventions that have been enumerated. We can't take anything for granted. Over the week, during the week, I saw a clip, uh, and, uh, and I think I posted it on the platform of the PTF, which says that you take a COVID-19 test on a Monday, and you are declared negative. And because you are waiting for a result on a Tuesday, you go to the beach. On a Wednesday, you go for a party. On a Thursday, you go for dinner. And do all manners of things. What that is depicting is that the test you are taking must be secured and protected. You can't afford to let lower or kind of put off your guard. Because by the seventh day, when they will come to take another test, you will begin to cough and execute the symptoms. Because the the, the, the negative test that you took on a Monday gave you this false sense of protection and you begin to indulge, indulge and indulge. And that has been the typical attitude like I've expressed here. In March, COVID-19 was dreadful. But by the time we got to July, June, 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 July, I mean, we, was, we had started romancing COVID-19. I'm thinking that, uh, okay, COVID-19 has come to be part of our lives. Uh, will all be affected. Those that will survive will survive, and those that will die will die. I don't think that's a positive attitude. The attitude is we must try to preserve our loved ones 
And the only way we can do that is to get in place the implementation and the enforcement of the non-pharmaceutical measures. Actually, you asked what would happen after uh, September. That's when we get to the end of the prescribed six months of the PTA. When we get there, and, uh, we'll think about how to cross the bridge. That's the truth. Uh, COVID-19 will not end in six months. We are all mindful of that. And we'll be very responsible enough to put a structure in place that will continue to provide leadership uh, uh, for the people of the country in terms of giving directions, issuing protocols uh, as we move forward. Uh, I'm not telling you that the life of uh, the BTF will terminate after six months. No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that the first set of assignment that we were given was entry in of six months. And when we get there, uh, we submit a comprehensive report to Mr. President. We we'll evaluate what is happening worldwide. Uh, we have not picked, we don't know when we are going to pick. If we get to the midst of September and things let loose, Obviously, you know that nobody can afford to go anywhere. They can't abandon the war at the point that is fearless. They must remain and fight the war with you because you are also you have also been in the battlefront. So I believe um, as we go into this new phase with the few modifications that have been made, personal responsibility should be uppermost in our minds. And truly, if you know the rate at which COVID-19 is ravaging, uh, we will continue to take those personal responsibilities and not take anything for granted, honestly. Uh, 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 we've allowed, we've allowed uh, the level 12 and above now to start coming to work on a daily basis. My appeal to these officers that will be coming to join those that have been working in the last three months. It's to understand that they are coming back to work and does not permit them and does not give them the license. If where they have been before, they have been living in a very casual manner. They are now coming to congregate in places of war. They must have this in their subconscious that they have a responsibility to protect themselves first and to protect their colleagues that they are coming to meet. I believe if we work with that sense of seriousness and resolution of the fact that we are collectively involved in this fight against COVID 19, God will help us as a country and as a people to lower the rate. Of infection, and eventually, if we get to the peak, bend the curve and begin to see a reduction. As you've seen, from four to ten states plus FCD, exceeding the margin of 1,000. So it means that these numbers will continue to progress. And I've said it often that we should not take the law in the, in the, in the numbers that have occurred in the last couple of days for granted. And play around with it. The fact of the matter is that uh, we are still in the spirit of uh, Salah celebration. So even the workforce are still in that spirit. Even the people that are charged with the responsibility. And if you look at the records, as uh, Emily always exhibited by the PD in the various other conditions control, our, our, our testing numbers are beyond. I dropped. Uh, uh, I'm glad that we had this meeting this afternoon. I'm going to also have one tonight to push with the state governments to ramp up their testing. Now the testing has been brought to their doorsteps. We have 60 laboratories in 31 states at the FCT. And we are working hard to ensure that every state has a well uh, good laboratory for the purposes of testing. So we need to ramp up the testing so that we can detect, we can find, and we can see what is happening right now in our communities. We cannot claim that we know what is happening in all the communities. And you can see the number of local governments. 
536 out of 774 have confirmed. So probably by the time we go another month or two, we would have covered all the local government with confirmed cases of COVID-19. So it means that there is no state, there is no local government that can claim that there is no COVID-19 ravaging in their communities. And that is why the ownership of the response was the important part from the rural communities, from the community leaders, from the religious leaders, from the traditional institutions. I think they have a responsibility of ostracizing people who walk around without masks in their communities. Because if you get to that, the people should be treated as outcasts if they don't wear masks to protect themselves and protect their people. But that responsibility can only be owned by the communities. The government cannot do everything when it comes to enforcement and causing behavioral change. So I want to thank you very much, and I believe going forward, we'll continue to cooperate and work together. Have a good day. Thank you very much, Chairman of the Presidential Task Force. We must thank all uh, our partners, particularly uh, members of the press and the various media houses that have been broadcasting live into the homes and offices of Nigerians. We also thank Nigerians who have been watching and listening for guidance on what's next to do regarding uh, COVID-19. But in case you missed uh, part of this national uh, briefing, a quick reminder on a number of issues. Uh, in the words of the chairman, we feel your pains, we share your concerns. Please know that all policies and measures are aimed at containing the spread of the virus and balancing between life and livelihood. Two is that uh, government and citizens are partners. Please do not expect enforcement before you change your behavior. Behavioral change is required, which is to save your own life. Three, the current phase has suffered from non compliance, disbelief, negativity, and skepticism. As a community, let us own this process. Let us own the fight against COVID-19 because it is still virulent, it is dangerous, and it is ravaging. To government officials, government meetings, and all other meetings, as it may apply, board meetings, etc., should please be held virtual so that you maintain all the distancing you do not crowd yourself into rooms. Uh, for labor, GL12 and above are now to resume full working hours. It used to be GL14 and above. It has been lowered to grade level 12. But as the chairman has advised, you cannot afford to be casual in your behavior. When you resume, protect yourself, respect your colleagues at work. Exit classes are to resume ahead of the major exams, no mask, no service. Please stop stigmatization. Always wear your mask. It is in our own interest to take responsibility. Finally, ownership of the pro process must cascade to all levels. Bear it in mind, family, community, local government, society, state government, and what have you. I thank you very much. This is just a quick reminder. God bless Nigeria. We hope to see you. Thank you.